Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar, Virtual Cinematography from Concept Art to 3D Render. My name is Elise, and I am your virtual host today. I'll be here to welcome you, and then I'll be behind the scenes in the chat. Please feel free to chat along, ask questions, let us know where you're from. We're really happy and excited that you're here with us today. And just so you know, the chat and the questions tab are on the bottom right hand corner of your screen. Let's see to the next slide. So it's my pleasure to introduce to you today our featured guest speakers. We have Giuseppe Improta from Bardell Entertainment. He is our star today. He created the presentation um, for you and for us, I should say. Um, he is the director of photography and head of lighting at Bardell. And then we are also joined by two Katana Creative Specialists. We have Sophie and Ruth here with us to help moderate the Q&A and help answer any Katana related questions you may have. Just so you know, this presentation is being recorded and the bulk of the presentation that I'll be playing for you, we will be playing for you, has been pre-recorded for streaming quality purposes. But like I said, we're here live and we're happy to chat along. So we're looking forward to that. But before I hand it over, I just want to let everybody know, if you haven't heard yet, the recent release of Katana 7 came out last November. Um, and I'm gonna play a quick overview video for everybody to get the highlights from the latest release. So I hope you enjoy uh, the overview vid video and Giuseppe's presentation. We'll be back for you at the end. Start your USD journey with Katana 7 and get the best of both worlds. With USD native workflows and Katana's powerful look dev and lighting tools, USD brings a unified standard to your pipeline, delivering enhanced collaboration, non-destructive editing, and improved asset reusability. Katana 7 introduces a brand new suite of native USD nodes, giving you a toolbox to import, manipulate, and build upon a USD stage using the new performance architecture shared with Nuke's USD 3D system. The new Scene Explorer tab brings together Katana's production-proven toolset with USD standards, for an even greater performance and experience when compared to the original Scene Graph tab. Familiar icons across Katana and Nuke make it easier for you to jump between both applications when working in USD. By displaying both USD and Katana Scene data under one tab, artists can use the same Katana workflows they know and love, like deferred loading, on USD data as well, allowing you to work with the best of both worlds. You can also now see native USD and Katana assets in the Hydra Viewer simultaneously. This entire implementation of USD in Katana helps you transition to USD at your own pace or stay in a non-USD workflow. Updates to the Attributes tab let you view and examine both USD and Katana detail all in one place, making it an invaluable tool for inspecting the scene, for troubleshooting and debugging. Get up and running in USD and Katana with our new video, so you can make the most of these new features. This is just the start of our journey with USD native workflows, with a broader vision plan for future releases. We've upgraded live rendering with multi-threaded support, making real-time adjustments and live render updates up to twice as fast. Plus, two new cache eviction strategies. Optimize memory management and ensure your tasks run smoothly, and efficiently. All of this adds up to a robust, reliable, and high-performance Katana, helping you to meet ever-increasing industry demands. We cannot wait to see what you create next. For more information on Katana 7, visit learn.foundry.com slash Katana. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this webinar. My name is Giuseppe Improta, and I am the Head of Lighting and Studio Director of Photography for Bardell Entertainment. First of all, let me thank the Foundry for organizing this webinar, as well as Bardell Entertainment and Disney Pictures to letting us use some extracted material from the Diary of a Wimpy Kid movie that was released this last Christmas. Um, what we're going to do today is going through the process that is converting or translating a concept art into a 3D render with everything that is in between. So I'm going to show you a sequence that has been extracted from the movie and how we went from the color script to the color key to the light rigs and then the final sequence itself. 
Before I get into that though, I want to make sure that I thank all the artists that worked in Bartel Entertainment on this movie and all the artists that in general work uh, in this field because we know that this kind of products takes a lot of people to get done and that is not really something that we can do on our own. It's only possible because so many people work together towards that common goal which is creating beautiful images. So really I'm here as a messenger but all the merit goes to all the artists that have worked on this and that work so hard under sometimes stressful deadlines to achieve everything that we need to do in time. In this presentation, in this webinar, I'm going to show you also uh, a bunch of art that has been created by Bula Iraliyev, that is our art director on this movie, and his team. And so I just want to thank him as well for creating such beautiful concept arts that we could use as a reference. And I also want to thank Giorgio Rivalta, that was the lighting lead of this movie, that really was a significant contribution to setting up all the key shots of the movie and really establishing the look that we wanted. So thank you very much. Before getting into the movie, let me give you a couple of words about Bardell Entertainment. Bardell Entertainment was uh, founded in 1987 and originally it was a traditional animation company, so hand-drawn uh, and standard painting. In the years, the needs of the market have changed, and so we have essentially expanded the available tools, but we have still kept the baseline of 2D work that was originally the target of this company. Today we have three offices. The headquarters is in Vancouver. Uh, we have an office in Kelowna that was added, added in uh, 2013. And then now we have just added an office in Montreal. So there is three different locations that are working together, even though Vancouver is the main hub where we sort of like organize all the work. In terms of projects that we have, uh, you can see here that um, um, there are different kinds of projects and that's tying in to what I was saying before. We have Ricky Martin, for example, that is a fully 2D or though digital animation project. And then we have um, the Dragon Prince um, that we also have won Emmys Awards for. And um, the one is a hybrid uh, way of doing things where we have a 3D rendering with the 2D look, so self-shading look, and a lot of painting as well. And then finally we have uh, the 3D products, the fully 3D animation projects. That is what we're going to talk today about. There you can see uh, the Adventures of Buck Wild, Ice Age, and then we have Roderick Lourdes, which is uh, the previous movie that we have worked on the Diary of a Wimpy Kid series. The one that we are talking today about is the new one, uh, which is a Christmas fever. So, how do we do things in Bardell? Here in this diagram, you can see that I have highlighted a few parts from the production cycle, right? Um, the first thing that you can see there is the script, because obviously the script is what determines what kind of environment we have to work with, what kind of mood, what kind of light in terms of time of day as well. So everything is really written in there. And the first important step is to really go through the script and make sure that we know exactly what we need to do. Now, is the, as, the prog as the movie progresses, like there are changes to that. Sometimes we realize that maybe a daylight ties better with the previous sequence than the night time, for example. And so things are a little bit fluid, although the changes are not always that big. <clears throat> as the script is finished and locked, then we can start planning for the 3D work. But here we are looking only at the let's say, concept art to rendering side of things. So I will deliberately ignore the asset development, effects development, and all the other side of the digital animation production. So the script defines all the environments and all the elements that we have to work with in terms of visual and storytelling, right? So how do we expand on that in a visual creative way that then can be used to create the style of the movie is the color script. The color script, I'm going to go back and forth with this slide so you guys can actually keep track of what we're doing. The color script is something like that. This is done by Bulat. 
Iraliyev and uh, his team. And you can see that this is pretty, pretty cool. They've done an incredible job on this one. You can see the color script has all these thumbnails here, essentially, that show a series of shots of the movie that represent the shots that define the mood and, in general, the tone and the colors of the, of the sequence, of each sequence. You can see on the right there is this representation of just the color gradient that shows the transitioning of the color into from one sequence into the other. And this is very important because usually correspond to a change in the story, a change in the mood. Of course, everything that we do in terms of, of visual reproduction is important to um, attach to the story. It's important to tell that story. And so this is an easy way to see, for example, how much of the, of the movie it's bright, how much of the movie gets darker in terms of really brightness and um, tones of the scene. Because in the slides you cannot really appreciate the quality of this work, I opened the file in Photoshop and here you can see um, more in detail. And you can see that if I zoom in, these actually are not just rough thumbnails, but they are fully fledged paintings that really describe each shot. And you can see even the name of the shot, the number of the shot, and you can see that there is also the description of the uh, time of day, although it's clearly obvious from the uh, thumbnails themselves, uh, but it's not as clear when you are inside. And uh, you can see here the progression of the movie that is really well explained in terms of visual cues, contrast, colors, and mood across all the different sequences. I was super happy with this work, and I think it looks really, really good. And it's such a good help to visualize these things ahead of time and have an idea of where to go in terms of 3D render as we progress towards the lighting, rendering, and composing stage. So super cool work here. Usually these color scripts are not as refined. They are a little bit rougher because they don't nearly need to go into the detail of each shot. But in this case, we have used a different approach where the actual thumbnails of the color script are in fact the key shots that we will use later as a reference for the artist. And I'll show you the hierarchy of this workflow in a second. So this is the color script. You can see that there is different sequences. We start inside, then we have the outdoor sequence. This also already defines the time of day, but this has subject to changes as well. As I said, the script might change, but sometimes we also realize that maybe uh, two sequences don't just latch together properly. And so in that case, we might have to do some changes. This is in fact the final version of it, but it's uh, not always been like that. There has been a few different changes. So we have this outdoor scene here, and then you can see as we progress, the time of day changes and the sun goes down, and then we are at night. And you can see that this progression actually happens also if you look at this um, color bar here on the right side that tells you all the way how things change. Now, the sequence that I want to show you is uh, his one. Uh, this is a candlelight scene. I thought it was cool because I love candlelight, personally. And uh, uh, there is one key shot here represented in this color script. And there is another one that really was for different sequences. But one important thing to mention here is that um, the setup that we can... Um, the setup that we can do that we have, we have in terms of how much time we can work on the assets, how much time we can work on the animation, and obviously how much time we can work on the lighting and rendering, and even how much time we spend on the color script. So we have to make sure that when we do something, we get right to the point, and that we can optimize as many things as we can. So if I go back to our workflow, this was the color script. Now here, you can see that after the color script, we go into the color keys. The color keys here have a double uh, way of getting work done. First, you can use the key shots that have been selected after the layout has been done. Let's define what a key shot is. A key shot is a shot that contains the visual elements that are needed to explain the sequence visually, obviously. So what does that mean? Well, if a sequence is effects rich, for example, if a sequence is a particular mood or a very difficult um, scene, like in terms of lighting, like for example, the candlelight, 
or it's a particular moment for the story itself, then we take that shot as a key shot. There is two approaches here because it depends a lot on how the production schedule works. Sometimes we have already the layout that is being done and so we can really take the layout shots, so those cameras and that composition, that framing, and paint over that to create the key shots. In other circumstances, instead, we don't have the layout ready and so those key shots are gonna be just essentially artwork that will reference that the artist will reference later, but they won't match exactly the set um, as it is built in 3D. Hope this makes sense. So in either case, we have to make these color keys. And the color keys are the references that we need for the artists in terms of translating those references to the 3D world, to so the 3D render. Here you can see here you can see a set of the color keys of the movie. You can see that they are pretty much the same as the color script, just here you can see them bigger. Um, and this is, as I said, not always the case. Sometimes your key shots are painted or the color keys are painted in much more details than the color script. But these are very much a good representation of what the scene should look like. What are the artists looking for? What kind of colors do we want in there? Uh, what kind of vibe we have? For example, you can see here, this top color key is here. This is like an happy moment. This is actually not in order of story right here, but um, you can see here, it's an happy moment. I don't want to spoil if you have not seen the movie, but essentially this happens towards the end. And uh, you can see that there is a vibrancy to it. There is a, a natural... Uh, happiness to that scene compared, for example, to something like this, where you have the crazy scientist sort of mood uh, with this very, very uh, saturated green light against the cyan um, slash blue environment, which is pretty cool. So really, when you have a good color key, the artist doesn't really have to imagine too much. Now, what is the problem, though? Well, the problem is that, unfortunately, sometimes the color key is painted in a way that does not take into account the fact that in 3D we use plausible rendering, which means the color of the surfaces, the shaders, the materials that we use, the lights, all interact in a realistic way, where, for example, a warm light will bounce over a white table and will bounce finally onto the characters, creating a cast, a red cast onto them. So it very much works as a real movie where we have to place the lights, but we have to also control even the set and the colors of the set to make sure that everything works coherently without creating weird things, right? Weird looking things. In my experience in animation, the work of set dressing and art direction of a set, it's usually done before we even get to the color key stage. And that sometimes creates problems because those color keys at that point are not really too meaningful because they might not be able to be replicated exactly in the way they've been painted. And this is sort of like where my role comes in, in Bartel, where I sort of like supervise the color keys, keeping in mind the assets, the colors that we have worked on or that we will work on and sort of like create an harmony uh, that allows the 3D artist to basically work efficiently on these things without having to bottle a color key that then did not take into account about the real properties of the materials, real properties of the objects in the set. So um, it is important to underline this point because these can create a lot of wasting, wasted time. If the artist is looking at a color key that has a green cast, but he cannot really get that without having to do a lot of compositing work, because in the lighting, the materials and the light do not create that effect, that creates a series of problems. And in, in particular, uh, there is problems that are related to the consistency of the shots. In Bardell, you will see, we like to create lighting that is 95, 90% close to the final result. I personally don't encourage too much compositing work because I wanna have uh, a, big, a good consistency across all the shots of a sequence. And it's important given the timeline constraints that we have. If we had the same time that we had on a feature film movie, a full budget feature film movie, 
this will be less of a concern because there would be a lot more iteration in terms of reviewing the movie, reviewing the sequence and reviewing the shots altogether. But in this case, we have to go a little bit faster. We don't have that kind of flexibility. And so I prefer to keep the lighting realistic. And when I say realistic, I mean, uh, without relying too much on tricks like light linking and shadow linking that inevitably create some sort of artificial look if not used properly and a lot of problems in balancing all the shots given the fact that it is a personal way of adopting lighting instead of a universal way like you would light a set. I prefer to have that consistency and I prefer to have a katana scene that when I open a render looks like the final render instead of having a katana scene that when it's looked at uh, looks completely different from the composite. I hope it, it makes sense. So let's go back to this uh, workflow. Once we have the color keys, so we know how each shot has to look like, then we have to go into the key shots. And the key shots are basically the 3D renders of the color keys. Let's have a look. So here, you can see the color keys in this slide versus the 3D render of this slide. So these are the key shots that we have created based on those color keys, okay? So you can see that if you look at some of these uh, images that I was pointing out before, like the shot of the happy ending, let's say, and then we have the shot of the crazy scientist. Of course, these are small, uh, so you cannot see too well, but I have selected that sequence that we can see more in depth. Okay, so this is the work that comes from the color keys. Now, when we work on something like that, we don't work on every single shot only. We have to consider, because of the things that I already mentioned before in terms of budget and time, also the whole sequence. So essentially, we have to create lighting setups, which are called light tricks if you're not on this side of the industry, that work for the majority of the sequences sorry, for the majority of the shots in the sequence. That's very important because it changes a little bit the approach to lighting and cinematography of the shots as well. In a real movie, you have a basic setup where you have practicals and you have replacing lights for the practicals to light the actors, but really every single shot is crafted and the lights have, are changed according to budget and time again, but usually you change every single shot to make sure that every shot really tells that particular part of the story. When it comes to products like that, the time needed to create something like this, it's such that we don't have that um, flexibility, that option. So we have to create these setups that work for the majority of the shots and then go back into the sequence and maybe find the handful of shots that really require a little bit more work that really require that extra touch because maybe they are super important for the story. And so the artists had to analyze the sequences and pick up essentially the shots that they believe would be a good representation of the whole sequence. Now, let me show you what I mean. This is one of the color keys that we have had for the candlelight shot, sorry, for the candlelight sequence. You can see here that this is fairly well explained. We have candlelight, we have some light coming from the phone, we have a cold background that is complementary of the foreground, and in general it's very easy to reproduce this. The problem is that if you focus only on this particular shot of the sequence, then you're gonna have a problem. Why? Because essentially you don't know what's around these guys, you don't know how many other cameras there could be that may be show areas that you did not set up if you did the setup only for these specific shots. And in general, when we render the whole sequence, we have to make sure that everything works well um, and that we have a sort of like consistency across every shot. So before we go to the next shot, which allows us to do a more generic setup of the sequence, I wanna show you the work in progress of this, how this was built, okay? So this is the color key. And here you can see a gray representation of these shots. Now, the gray pass, as it's called, is not always done in animation work. And I'm not sure why, but I find it extremely useful when I have to review the contrast of the shot without worrying about materials and textures. It is something that is more adopted in visual effects, but I have asked to introduce that into 
the 3D animation process as well, because it is very helpful for me to just ignore all elements that could be out of balance, could be temporary, and just focus on the contrast. And because I have an expertise and a background in cinematography, and I know how the camera sees things, and more or less how the exposure will be translated when we add the colors to this, for me it's very important to see this and establish that particular look. So here you can see that we have um, sort of like the contrast of the scene, right? There is no colors here with the exception of the background uh, or, well, sorry, <clears throat> there is no materials here with the exception of the color of the sky, of the background, and we are really focusing on where the light is going. For me, this is super, super important. Also, you can see that we have the reference spheres. And that's another thing that I picked up from the visual effects experience. And it's another thing that we don't really use in 3D animation a lot, but it's super helpful. When you review shots and you look at the spheres, you know immediately how the lights have been placed. And because I always have in mind uh, the sequence itself, I can tell the artist and guide them in case I feel that that setup will not work for other shots or that there is something wrong, like maybe a light is too close, which is a common uh, mistake that some people do <laughs> when they put lights in 3D. Um, where you can actually hide the lights, unlike a real set where you cannot do that and you need to really know how to place those lights properly. The next step is the color. And here you can see something odd. Now, this is sort of like a temp um, version of this shot. And you see a bunch of zombies in there and a bunch of weird things. And I wanted to deliberately pick this shot to show that things don't go always according to plan. And there is always some things that you have to bottle. In this case, there was some problem with the animation and the assets. And so we got these extra characters in there. And you don't always figure out ahead of time or sometimes you have to leave them there uh, because of technical reasons. So in general, this is a good example of how things can go sideways very quickly. But now we start having the materials, we start balancing the light, we can see that maybe the candle is too hot, definitely <clears throat> Susan here is too hot, and in general the look of this shot does not match still the color key that we have. Another thing that you will also see is that the temperature that we are using here, we like to use Kelvin. We like to use color temperature that is consistent with reality, unless obviously the scene requires otherwise. Today in cinematography you have RGB lights, so this is not a big deal to just pick a color, because we can actually reproduce all the lights we want. But that's a risky business, because a lot of times we tend to use too much saturation in the lights, and that makes things a little bit weird. Even for an animation uh, movie like that, where you can sort of like push the boundaries a little bit, if you pick colors that are too saturated, you are not going to get a very nice result. So next we have the actual shot. So here you can see that we have balanced the colors and the intensities and the brightness. And now this is a lot closer to match the color keys that we had originally. Still, the color temperature is slightly different because when you have light sources that are 1500 Kelvin, 2000 Kelvin, like those candles, um, inevitably you're going to have a very strong red cast that the color key did not depict. And that's not because um, the color key is not good enough, but it's just because there is always a hint of artist's touch in those color keys, right? So like you have the ability when you draw something to sort of like override reality if you want. But unfortunately, when you go into the 3D world, you cannot always do that. Um, unless you start doing a lot of compositing work as well, or very refined shot-by-shot -shot work. So this is what we settle for. Now, once again, this is a sort of like a, a small section of the room there. And so we had to pick a different color key keys to see a little bit wider in this room, what is happening in the rest of the room. Now, this color key here, in fact, is um, originally done for a different sequence. And uh, because the light setup and essentially the mood and the colors are the same, we reuse this for these sequences as well, because it just works. And so we have a key shot here. Again, you can see another example where things go wrong. That's the zombies in there. And it, it happens because I will explain you how in Bardell we approach the problem of creating essentially sequences. Um, we have these kind of problems. And then 
afterwards we have the final shot. You can see if I go back and forth that there is different kind of um, changes here between the first version, the second version, right? So this is this is the first version. You can see some characters are even gray here because the materials were not properly attached. There are all sorts of problems as you work uh, in these shots. So it's not like open the scene and render. It doesn't work like that. And then finally, we have this uh, um, version where you can see there is more red on the left. There is a little bit more fill because there is a fireplace in the back that is supposedly on. So there is more attention to the detail. And then finally, we correct the things that are visually annoying. For example, on the right side, Susan is becoming way too strong, too bright. And so we darken that and we change the background as well. Now, this is a little bit the process that we go through. And there is many iterations across these little changes. There is many fixes that we have to do, but gives you an idea of how the process is. In this shot in particular, you can see that there are candles and lights a little bit everywhere. And that's important for the artist to know because he has to place these lights uh, across the scene so that then when we render the shots in the sequence, we have those lights in place. And we don't have to necessarily go shot by shot and position lights one by one. So this is a mixed approach that is sort of like a practical lighting approach mixed with a classic cinematographic approach or if you want animation approach, where we have practical lights that actually do the lighting on the sets and on the characters, and then we add in as we need. Here you can see the two shots together with the color keys. You can see them side by side. And I think it's pretty cool to see how they worked out. So let me play the sequence, and then let me show you in Katana how we do set up this um, process of creating this lighting setup across different sequences. Well, with the power out, Rowley can't call the cops and spill his guts out about the snow pop. And with the whole town snowed under, nobody's getting to that bin. So my secret's safe, at least for now. All I need to do is make it to Christmas morning without anyone in my family catching on. Because in one week, I can call that video game system mine. Okay. Three cases of water and one hundred twenty rolls of toilet paper, flashlights with fresh batteries, plenty of canned goods. Ooh. Gee, yeah. Greg, you're already shivering. The power's only been out for a half hour. Yeah, we're already starting to lose heat, and if it gets cold enough in here, the pipes could burst. So nobody touch the bottled water, just in case. <laughs> we might need to use it to flush the toilets. Eh, I never really flush anyway. Yes, Frederick, we've noticed. Do we really have enough food? What if we run out? I just went grocery shopping. We'll be fine for two weeks at least. I read about this family that got snowed into their cabin. And to survive, they had to eat each other. Gross. Yummy. Roderick. Uh, scary man. <laughs> the last guy felt kind of bad. <sighs> well, I think everything's going to be just fine. And the next few days are going to be fun. Well, what could be better than being snowed in with your family for the holidays? Literally anything. No phones, no television, no distractions. Just the five of us sharing in the joy of each other's company. It's a Christmas miracle. There you go. So this is the sequence, the final sequence. You can see how many different angles are there, how many different uh, cameras. And so we have to make sure that we make a setup that works for the majority of them. So how do we do that? Let me show you. So if we go back to this diagram here, you can see that after we have done the key shots, we have this sequence first, middle, last, which means that we take that key shot and the setup, the light trick that we have done in that key shot, and we just render every single shot in first, middle, and last frame with that. And this is only possible thanks to Katana, because we have internal tools that allow us to basically manage this process without even opening Katana itself. But Katana allows us to basically manipulate changes in a very fast way, in a very quick way, and also to override some shots or some parts of the sequences very, very quickly through a specific setup that we have. After this uh, first, middle, last has been evaluated in terms of does this light ring really cover all the shots? What are the shots that are not working? What are the shots that need more work in terms of visual um, complexity? 
then we can go ahead and select the parent shots. So these are our parent shots, which are essentially other key shots that, of which we don't really have a color key. But because they belong to the same sequence and we sort of know how the room is lit at that point, we just use them to evaluate that kind of setup in those specific cameras and those specific angles. And then finally, we select the sub shots that belong to parent shots and key shots. So they use the same setup, the same light rig. And then we propagate the light rig to those and we render them all together. And then finally, there is all the reviews for every shot, for every key shot, for every sequence, and so forth and so on. So that's how the process works. Let me show you in Katana how we handle all of this. So here in Katana, I've loaded my shot. This is our shot loader, which is not your classic open scene here. Uh, it's something that we have built in-house custom. And here are, you have all the shots, and here you have the versions of each shot. So we can go back between versions easily. And uh, once it's open, you can see here how the node graph looks like. So you can see that in here, as you open the scene, there is not a lot going on. It seems like almost there is only a bunch of groups, which is in fact what it is. So we have our import automatic, we have a bunch of these live groups, and we have these panels, these backdrops that tell the user or the artist uh, what to do in each panel. So I'm, I'm adding here the um, diagram that we looked at into the slide so that you can remind yourself how we work on this. Essentially, we have a bird's eye view on the sequence. We select the key shot, we create the light rig for the sequence based on that. You can see here that we have a sequence group. If I open this sequence group, there is a bunch of things in there, right? These things are basically all um, the attributes that we want to have into that sequence. For example, you can see here that there is a bunch of layers uh, candles, flames that obviously will not belong to any other sequence or maybe to some sequences, but not all. And so they are in this sequence group. We also have a sub-sequence group here where essentially we can isolate shots in within the sequence that maybe require specific nodes. For example, if in a few shots we need to remove a wall or we need to prune something that is blocking the light or is creating a weird shadow, we can also do it from here. And we don't have to do that into a shot-by-shot -shot base workflow. As long as there is a baseline of operations that we have to do across the shots, we can act on different levels as we need. And finally, there is the shot group here, which has sort of the similar attributes as the sequence group, but we have here all the things that are specifically done for the shot. Now, in terms of lighting and rendering, which is what we are here for, really, we have in the sequence group, we have our um, gaffer group. You can see that here you have sequence lighting and this gaffer group has all the light rigs that we need for that specific sequence. This light rig now is basically working for the key shots that the light rig has been developed for. And we don't know that this will necessarily work at first for every other shot. And this is where Katana comes into play. Because now with the custom tool that we have, we can in fact take this light trick and without even opening Katana, we can propagate that into every other shot of the sequence. And again, as the diagram shows here, we can have now a first, middle, last frame of every single shot to check if this light trick will cover everything that we need, will cover every angle that we need. If not, then probably we will need to do a particular light trick that has maybe some um, variables in terms of having some lights that are on or off for specific shots, or maybe we realize that we just have to add more lights to the sequence or to this starting point. And once this process has been done, then we can essentially uh, call the sequence ready to be rendered. As the artists open their shots, their individual shots, because these are live groups, uh, these live groups are basically propagated with that tool that is a, a proprietary tool, so I cannot really show you here. But 
it is uh, essentially through Katana that we can load live groups and have everything that has been done in the original scene, for example, in this scene here, into the other shots. Every shot will inherit automatically all the setup that we set up in the show setting as well as in the sequence setting. So the show setting contains, for example, all the uh, render settings and the baseline that we want to have, all the kind of stuff that we want to keep consistent across all the sequences. The sequence group will have the light trick that is developed for those key shots. And when the artists load their own shot, they will have all these things loaded automatically for them to have a very solid starting point. They don't have to essentially change much to the shot until it comes to actually doing shot work. So defining layers, defining uh, maybe layers for that shot. Usually the layers, we also define them at the sequence level because it's something that we like to approach into the key shots. Uh, but if there are layers that are needed for specific purposes, then the artist can work into the shot level. <clears throat> as much as the light rig is basically coming through as <clears throat> basically a um, reference of the original light rig from the sequence and can be overwritten at any point. So if I go here and change this into be editable, now my light rig can be changed and can be adapted to what I need in this specific shot here. And then this shot, for example, I can adapt this for editing and I can change this light just in this shot. The power of this is that I'm not changing anything of any other sequence in, because I'm working on a shot level. But if I need to change something to the whole sequence, then I can also do that by working in the sequence level. So this is just a glimpse of how powerful this is. I hope this sort of makes sense. So when we are ready to publish our scenes, then I can just do publish the shot with our publisher. And you can see here that we have each live group basically under different interface with versions. And we can publish whatever we need that we wanna publish. If we have done a change in the sequence and we want that change done in this shot to basically be applied across the whole sequence, then we can do it because I can publish this sequence group. And again, it means that every other shot will pick up the sequence group as it's open by the artist. Otherwise, I usually have artists only publish the shot settings because that's really what they work on. Sequence and show group are untouchable, if not by leads or key artists or supervisor. So we keep this contained so that the artists have their own space to work and maybe make mistakes and adjust things according to what they want, but we can always go back safely to any point. No other software allows this kind of flexibility right now. And this is the reason why we can also render so many shots so quickly, because we have this kind of interface and this kind of setup. And this is very important as we develop the look, because as we decide that the look uh, changes in terms, for example, of mood or color, we can always quickly update all the shots at once. And we don't have to worry about opening every single shot by hand. So that gives you a little bit of an idea of what we do here in Katana. All right, I hope this was helpful. This should give you a glimpse into the complex process that is converting a beautiful uh, painting from our art department into an animated 3D render. And uh, the process is quite complicated, but I hope that this made you curious and to go and discover more. If you have questions, you can also point them uh, to myself. You can contact me at this email address and you can also check out my YouTube channel if you are interested in learning more about this kind of stuff. Thank you very much for your time. Hello everyone. Great presentation, Recipe. I've learned a lot. Um, I'm sure everybody enjoyed the presentation. I really liked the part uh, with the zombies. Brought me back some some good memories from my time in studios. Uh, yes. So um, thank you to all the artists who also worked 
on the production. Uh, I love what I've seen. The paintings were beautiful, really nice color keys. It was really well done. Um, so I think we can start with the questions. We have a lot of questions in uh, the question chat. It's amazing. Thank you guys for, for joining and putting all of these there. Uh, we'll, we will get to them uh, after uh, we ask our little bit of our own questions because we do have questions as well. So uh, for a production like that, uh, Giuseppe, how many people worked on, on the show across departments of Bardell? How did you manage to make this work? Uh, yeah, hi everybody. Like uh, it's nice to see some known names in the in the people there. So thanks for joining. Um, to get to your question, it depends. Like on average in Bardell, we have over four hundred people uh, that work on productions like these. Uh, there are some productions that are faster than others, and so we have to sort of intertwine the, the artists between different productions according to the schedule. Um, but on average, I would say that we need. 250, 300 people in uh, across different departments if the uh, movie is a full length one. Oh, wow. So, yeah, there is a lot of work to be done there. Okay, yeah, a lot of people to thank, to be thankful for uh, when we see uh, this movie and the credits and everything. Um, so, uh, yes, I'll pass the, 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 the mic to, to Ruth because I know she has some good questions. Uh, we shared that a bit before because uh, we were watching a bit of the webinar before you guys. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, thanks, Giuseppe, for the webinar. That was um, it was really great, really insightful. Um, yeah, the the one that I was wondering about, and I think someone has also mentioned it uh, as well, so we might touch on it a little bit later. But um, between the sort of color key stage and the three D stage, do you ever get to three D and then um, realize that something might not be working in terms of the lighting or color for a particular sequence? Um, and then how does that process work? Do you have to go back to the color key and make changes or can you make those changes on the lighting side? Excellent question. It depends a little bit on the client, really, because once the color key is approved, you're not supposed to change it uh, anymore. And so that becomes literally a translation of the color key into the lighting. Now, sometimes I explain the client that maybe this will be more beneficial time-wise and uh, um, I would allow us to be more effective in the delivery of the shots if we stayed with slightly different lighting, for example. But it is also my role to approve the color keys before they go out. And so I try to avoid <laughs> killing myself um, in, in that kind of situation. So we try to essentially plan the color keys and review the color keys with the lighting in mind, which is something that does not always happen. And so by doing that, we also get familiar with the clients and we explain them the process so that they get, get also accustomed to the fact that the color key, yes, is there, but it's not necessarily the Bible of the shot. Uh, artists also uh, know that there is some flexibility in interpreting that for the reasons that I explained in the presentation, but also because sometimes we really have to rush because maybe we are late. Um, and so we have to be able to be flexible um, in the way we interpret those things. And in terms of how do you, as a director of photography, how do you uh, draw the line and say, this is good enough, I'm, it's ready to, uh, to be uh, published as is, or so how, what, what is your decision-making process in, in that regard? So this is an interesting question because um, really uh, my job is not necessarily do what I like or approve what I like. It's to think about what the client will like. Mm -hmm. um, and so it really, it, it really is a process at the beginning to nail what the client wants through a series of different, uh, for example, variation of the same shot and to analyze the style of the movie at the beginning so that then this opens the door for everything that comes after. Um, so in terms of defining when the shot, when the color key is good enough or when the shot is good enough, it depends on the time that we have um, and, uh, and um, how many shots, for example, that specific key shots unlocks in terms of how many shots we can render with one setup. So mm -hmm. there is a different, uh, I would say, multiple variables that determines that. But I always have to think not uh, necessarily uh, about the quality that I want to reach. I always have to average that with the production needs 
um, and the artist needs, because if the artists have too many shots, then it becomes very difficult to achieve the quality that we need. Uh, we don't want to stress out people too much. Like uh, I like to work in an environment when, where we can make it work if there are constraints, because there is always creative solutions to a problem that don't necessarily require working too many extra hours, if not needed. We like to hear that. As artists, I'm sure all the, the artists are happy to hear that uh, there it's going to be a reasonable quota for them. <laughs> uh, so I think we can start uh, to read the questions in the chat. Uh, I'll let Ruth start uh, with the maybe the first question at the bottom from Diego, and then we'll go uh, where we up with all the questions. Some are for us at Foundry, some are for Bordel. Uh, so we'll go through them one by one. So I'll let you start. Uh, yes, yeah, so uh, the first question is what lighting system do you use with Katana? So what um, Ranger, I believe, is the uh, the question there. Uh, yeah, so it depends on the production because every kind of project requires different renders, um, not, not necessarily too many. Like we have a couple of renders. So it can be either Renderman for the fully 3D production projects that we have, or it could be also 3D light when we have cell shading. Uh, that requires um, cartoon lines and things like that. We have a custom workflow that we have developed with them that allow us to do, for example, the Dragon Prince work that we have done. Um, but in general, anything that is realistic or plausible, plausibly rendered, it's a render map. Oh, thank you. Um, um, the next. Oh, you can go. Sorry. Keep going. <laughs> no, no, you can keep going. That's fine. Yes, that's all. Good. Uh, yeah, I was just going to say the next one that we have is um, the changes that you mentioned. Uh, were they done in Saikatana or were they done in Comp? I think this was when you were talking about the iterations with the lighting process. So there is a distinction that we do internally in terms of Comp versus lighting task. The lighting task is what defines really the mood of the sequence. And uh, in within certain limits, then we adjust that into the Comp. We don't do crazy adjustments in the comp, uh, but when we work, those uh, shots that I presented are key shots. So we want them to be spot on from Katana. So any compositing change that we do, then it's reflected into Katana. Well, to the best of the possibilities of the artist, there are some changes that you cannot necessarily bring back to Katana. But for the most part, we bring those back into Katana so that when the other artists receive the key shot, they have something that is already ready to render. They don't have to go into the comp and figure out what's happening. Um, that's very important for me. It speeds up things considerably. Um, but when we have shot work in the sub shots or uh, secondary shots, uh, we do um, adjustments like that in uh, the compositing. There is nothing wrong with it. And uh, it actually it makes a lot more sense to do that in the comp than not re-render a shot for an exposure change, for example. Great, thank you. And the next question is uh, from Pei Yang, so I'm gonna ask it. So how do you deal with unrealistic color key? Do you try to match the painting, adjusting the shader, texture in 3D, or do you convince your client the color key is not realistic and it's not achievable? So how do you work with that? Teong, thanks for the hard question, my friend. <laughs> um, Teong is an old friend, so. Uh, oh, okay, of question. course. Um, so here's the thing. I don't like to say that we cannot achieve something ever. And so if there are ways to do it uh, and it takes a little bit more time, that's the conversation. So I'll tell the client, we can do this, but that's going to take a little bit more time on our side. So then it becomes a matter of do we have that time production-wise? Can we make that time? And how is important to the client to get that? Obviously, sometimes you have to average that with the requests. Uh, you cannot always get away with asking for more time. And so then it becomes a technical strategy in order to get that result. Uh, but if I have to push for having a more realistic render, that has to have, that has to, have to do with the... Uh, with the timing that it will take, with the time that it will take to do otherwise. So um, I cannot always convince the client, but because the, as I said before, the color keys are approved internally first, and I am the one that usually oversees this process at the beginning of the movies. 
uh, I try uh, to avoid situation to putting myself and the team in situations that are too difficult for the project. Other times, if we have the budget and the time, we just go for it and make it happen. So, hope that makes sense. It does. Uh, the next one from uh, Joshua. This is an interesting question. Um, what's the purpose of a color key if it's not based on reality? Wouldn't it be better to create the color key in a 3D software? Um, so this is interesting. Uh, the color keys are made because we can iterate through colors, moods, and contrasts quickly. We don't have to deal with materials. We don't have to deal with 3D problems, with animation, caches, and all the technicalities behind it. So that's why we do color keys. In theory, if you had everything ready, you could just go ahead and just make a 3D shot and do a key shot right in 3D. But that's never the case. And also, as everything else in life, you need to have a clear goal to make it quick, to make it happen quick. Uh, if you don't have a clarity in your mind of where the lighting has to go, you're going to start having a zigzag process that takes time to be refined and hence more iterations. Instead, if you go straight to the point and you give the artist a even not 100% accurate representation of where we want to be, they can quickly achieve that result. And then the remaining, I would say, 20%, that always takes a lot of time. It's where the artist put most of the work. Unfortunately, this is not an industry where you can allow every single artist to think uh, for themselves on every single shot in terms of creative achievements, because there's so many shots to do, right? Uh, but we can give them a direction, and then, of course, we can um, astray by the, uh, from those color keys a little bit if there is an interesting idea. And we are always open to explore that even after the fact. But it's just easier to iterate with the color keys. Even if they have um, the plausibility issue that I mentioned, it's just easier to do that. And then if there is a dialogue between the 3D department and the art director, not all the art director are very familiar with the 3D workflow uh, in terms of actually lighting, rendering, and create look there. Um, and so you have to have that bridge there to sort of like make them aware of what the limitations are and the constraints relative to the projects as well. That's a very good answer. That was a tricky question, but with a very good answer. <laughs> and it explains it all. Um, we have another question from Erin here. We've been answering it. Um, we'll be, we can be in contact with you for uh, an indie license. Um, and hi, Erin. Because uh, I know you personally. <laughs> um, so another question from Abel here. It says, "Do you turn the light rigs into assets that can be carried uh, into another sequence on the same location uh, and live in, and live outside the sequence, or do they live inside the sequence and need to be saved over to another when needed?" I think we're maybe talking about live groups here, but how does it work at Bardell for your light rigs in two sequences? So the light rigs, because we have these proprietary tools that we have built uh, to basically populate sequences and shots on demand, uh, it is literally a, maybe three seconds pro time to, for example, put a light rig from one sequence into the other, uh, but also from one shot into another. And we can also cross-reference shot light rigs so that basically if one shot we like better, we can easily take that and populate the other shots. And this is all done um, outside of Katana. Uh, so through the interface that we have, of course, in the back end is through Katana um, uh, SDK, but it's the interface that allows us to do that. So in other words, the, the everything is assetized, but the, is not really the light trick that is assetized, is the module that we want to export. Then we can also propagate just the light trick if we wanted to. So there is, there is different complexity to what we need to do. It's meant to be done quickly uh, so that we don't waste time in tedious operations like saving files, exporting things, figure out where they are, all the usual stuff that is prone to error. We try to get rid of it in the pipeline. There's still a lot to do as every other pipeline in the world. <laughs> <laughs> 
it seems pretty good on pictures. It was, uh, it seems yeah. pretty organized. <laughs> Uh, the next question is by uh, Hercules. Were the light rigs generated in Katana directly or in another DCC? Yeah, it's all done in Katana. Um, as I said, the only thing that we change is usually the render engine, uh, depending on the project, but the lighting and the look dev, it's uh, all done in Katana. Great, thank you. Great, answering questions on the side here. Um, so are we still gonna answer a few more questions and then uh, we will wrap up. Uh, we appreciate the enthusiast, but we need to uh, keep going. Uh, so we'll answer uh, Jose here. He says, you mentioned any, uh, any given change in the master is actually affecting all the other shots. So how do you avoid any issues with the shots already on the farm? Uh, wouldn't this affect what the artist is expecting their render to come to come out like? Um, so yes, it's about issues with renders when you make changes to your uh, to your shots. So we do not usually make changes that are important um, if the key shot has been approved or the key shots have been approved. That's exactly to avoid these kind of mistakes. The rendering on the farm or not the farm doesn't matter because we have a versioning system. Most companies have that where the scene that is on the farm does not get affected if there are updates locally um, for the artists. But the important thing is that we want consistency. And so we don't want three shots rendered in a certain way and another 10 um, in a, with a different look. So what we are very careful with is approving the key shots and then propagating those key shots to the sub shots once the client has approved them. Uh, no key shots is approved is um, propagated to sub shots if the client has not approved it. That's that's imperative. Uh, there are situations though where we realize after the fact that maybe a sequence has to change and the time of day changes or maybe there are some things that our late requests or things like that. And so in that case, we have to go back and re-render essentially the shots that have been done. And that's inevitable. Uh, but we try to keep that to a very minimum. Great. Um, I'm just looking. I know that we're running a little bit short on time, so I'm trying to see which questions um, might be upvoted the most that we can it's go to. Time, it's time to vote. What is your favorite question that <laughs> yeah. you would like to answer? <laughs> if you're still with us, you can go through them as well and let us know. <laughs> Let's start with this one. Um, so the color keys concept art is very illustrative and stylized, um, but the final render doesn't reflect that. So I suppose the question is, uh, how close is the color keys um, designed to be for the final result of the render? Excellent question. So the problem here is that 2D doesn't translate in 3D. It just doesn't. Uh, it, it requires extreme work to have that kind of stylized um, rendering and a huge amount of compositing work. There are examples, obviously, of the caliber of Spider-Man Homecoming that have proven that, right? But that requires a lot of custom work per shot and a lot of work compositing work. So in this case, the color keys were not a representation of the style of the render, but they were a representation of the color um, and let's say the, the photography of the exposure of the shots, um, not necessarily how the show would have looked like. And for this reason, we do an intensive R&D session with the clients at the beginning where we actually show what we can do and what are the opportunities that we have to customize certain things and that then we move from there. There are other instances where there is a particular design to the characters and obviously those things are easier to translate into 3D but things like brushing um, or uh, patterns or texture or lines are something that uh, uh, require a lot of custom work. That's why, as I mentioned, for uh, the Dragon Prince, we had to develop a custom pipeline for the lines um, of the characters to have them stable and working well. Uh, but that takes a lot of time. And so sometimes you have to, you can do that if you have a return on the investment. So that means a bunch of series or like something that, um, 
has more time to be developed and that time is budgeted. Uh, otherwise, we have to find uh, alternatives to that. Sounds good. Okay, I think we are going to wrap up here. Uh, I'm going to go with the most voted one. So it's going to be uh, the one from Gotham. Um, so you would, you would like uh, a few pieces of advice on what elements we should focus on as students oh, and you're a teacher, so that's perfect for you. Uh, so uh, do you want to know, um, okay, what we should focus on as students to have a strong color theory. Uh, what does the Bartle Studios expect to have in a student's showreel? And uh, yeah, if you're hiring for look dev and lighting artists, what can you suggest? Give the best advice you can. Sure. So first of all, look dev and lighting are two different disciplines. Uh, usually, if you do look dev, you're not doing lighting. There are, especially in animation, there are instances in visual effects where that's not the case, and you can do both things. I've done both for a long time myself. Uh, but I, I feel like, especially in animation, because the lighting is more on the artistic side of things, and there is more of a creative process um, compared to visual effects, where the majority of the work is more like plate matching although things have changed a lot in the last few years with the complexity of the shows. Uh, so I would not necessarily suggest to have a lighting and look up showreel. I would rather see a lighting showreel uh, and a look up showreel as two different people or two different applications myself. The reason why I'm saying that is because it's different skill set. Um, making materials is not necessarily required to become a good lighter. And vice versa, you don't have to be a necessarily a good lighter to create good materials, although there is some baseline knowledge there that can be shared across the two disciplines that is important to have. Now, in terms of how um, to develop your color theory and the artistic side of things, there are some things that I always tell my students at university that is do things. Um, it's easy to sit down and start doing things on the computer, but they don't necessarily stay with your brain the same way that if you, uh, for example, uh, painted oil, or if you painted watercolors, or if you did sculpting, uh, or if you actually went to a set and tried to put the lights in there and see really how these affects. Because when we do things practically, there's multiple senses that are at work. And so that experience becomes engraved into your brain in a different way than when you just use, for example, your visual uh, senses in your your uh, brain there. There's the social component as well, where you have to do a project with some friends that is a little bit more of a involved uh, activity. And so you remember that a little bit better. So my practical advice would be learn how to draw a little bit. You don't need to be Michelangelo. It's just more like a form of mentis, like a, the way that you want to approach things. Learn to paint a little bit. It's also very good things to learn how the colors can be mixed. Uh, most people don't even know the names of the colors, for example. Um, if you ask people oil color names and they work in 3D and they've only done 3D, not everybody knows uh, what is a carmine red, for example, right? But it's actually a very important tool to describe that precise, precise color. And when you have to dialogue with somebody that understands those things, it becomes a very, very quick way of getting to the point and communicating fast. And the other thing would be, if you want to do lighting, for me, it's absolutely fundamental to understand uh, notions of photography and cinematography, because even though we are creating in 3D, the reality is that now we have plausible renders, as I was saying, and there is a lot that is shared. Uh, as we have seen in the last years, you have lenses that are being part of the uh, creative choices now. You have distortions. You even have real cameras with motion capture. So knowing how the camera sees things also gives you an idea of uh, what does it mean to create a cinematic look, um, which is not necessarily something that you learn right away when you do 3D because you have the availability of infinite lights, you have the availability of, uh, um, you know, like whatever power you need. The way the camera sees is not how we see, although the cameras have improved in the dynamic range and things like this. So having that kind of spectrum of, Potential, I think, allows you to be not just a good executive artist that does the job, but also somebody that can analyze and um, 
dis discern what is a good image, really. How do I create an image that is cinematic and looks good? Sorry, that was a bit of a long answer. <laughs> no, that was good. It makes us want to attend one of your classes at university. We're all going to uh, to one of your classes. That's the next step. Um, well, I think this is it for today. Uh, today's webinar. I say thank you for everybody who joined, who participated, asked asked all these good questions. Uh, thank you to Giuseppe and Ruth for joining everybody from the Foundry team behind the scene, answering all these questions, and also for sure, uh, all the artists making those amazing movies that we love seeing. Uh, thank you, uh, Vancouver, because I'm in Vancouver. And uh, yeah, I think this is it, and we can wrap up. Anything you would like to add, both of you, before we, we go? Just the same, I'll just take thank you. Yes. <laughs> let's let's talk all together. <laughs> all, right, all right, perfect. Uh, have a good day or a, a good night if you're uh, somewhere across uh, the world. And thank you for joining. See you soon. Thank you very much.